Hey, we're going to be talking about Chapter 11, Community Mental Health. These are the learning objectives. We're going to look at the difference between mental health, mental illness, and mental disorders. We're going to be talking about DMS-5 and its limitations. What is that? We're going to talk about examples of mental disorders. We're going to look at toxic stress. We're going to look at the history of mental health care in the United States. This one's going to have an assignment tied to it. We're going to identify the major problems faced by people who have mental health illness and are homeless. And we're going to list the basic treatments for mental health. Uh, lastly, we're going to identify key clinical, multicultural, practical, and political changes. These, this, these are the key topics and focus areas for this um, lecture. So when I talk about mental health, mental illness, and mental disorders, you'll see a great little definition call out page on page 290 of your book. Mental health looks at everything. It's encompassing all aspects of your life when it comes to your sleep, to your um, emotional social health, um, to your cognitive functions, ability to process. These um, are a broad aspect um, and it, it's called mental health. Mental illness is an umbrella um, of mental disorders. So mental illness is a collective term for all diagnosable mental disorders. And so mental disorders um, have diagnostic codes and diagnostic terms to each of them. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this. So these three terms are distinct in each other. Uh, you see mental health is encompassing. Mental health is an umbrella to the mental disorders. And so um, NAMI which stands for the National Alliance on Mental Illness, has um, the list of different types of disorders um, that are fall under mental illness. And you can see there's a broad list of them. And you'll see that mental illness is one of the leading uh, disabilities for all ages combined. And um, alcohol and drug use disorders are considered a part of mental illness. So they're separated out here, but realize that addiction is a part of mental illness and is classified as a disorder. So it's one of the big, um, big underlining uh, morbidity issues in the United States. A lot of illnesses related to this, but if you look at these other physical illnesses, you could see that some of these physical illnesses can directly be impacted by mental, uh, mental illnesses. So someone could be having digestive uh, disorders or diseases that are exasperated by mental illness. Um, cardiovascular, high blood pressure can be exasperated by mental illness. So when you look at this chart, don't look at these as separated, but look at the fact that mental illness is one of those things that silently uh, is out there and it creates a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, secondary effects on physical illnesses too. Um, and so, in fact, um, the prevalence of mental, disor mental uh, disorders is something that I put in your um, learning module where you can tap out um, onto this, and I'm going to go ahead and do this, um, tap out, and this is uh, the web page right here, um, and you could see that you could see the different rankings of mental health disorder, uh, mental health disorders. And what they're doing is they're taking the prevalence of mental um, illness. And you see Oregon's ranked 50. That's not a good thing. You don't want to be at the bottom. But what that's saying is that Oregon might not have the infrastructure to support mental health illnesses. Um, it does prevalence of mental illnesses. And it, it gives you some statistics to, to, to look at. Um, so I thought that would be interesting, especially for people that are doing their project um, on mental illnesses or doing a project on one aspect of mental, mental illnesses. Um, let's see what else. I'm going to get back to my PowerPoint now um, and bring that back up. So when you look at this, this is, this is actually in your learning module. You could see that the prevalence of mental disorders 
are, are, are ranked and they do collect data on this. And you can drill down on suicide and some other different mental illnesses um, that are out there. So one of the big things that you need to know about is that, that there's something called the DSM-5. This is a Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders and is what's used by um, every person who's ever involved with, um, with a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a social worker. Um, I've worked with social workers before and you literally will see this on their desk and it will have all these different things tagged. And what they do is they use these, and you can actually go to the library and find this book. Um, they use these to, to, um, to classify mental disorders, but they also use it for reimbursement. Um, and so you'll see that this is something that's very much a tool um, in, in mental health um, and professionals who are, are in that field and treating mental disorders. But there are limitations of the DSM-5. Drug companies run ad campaigns marketing using terms from the DSM-5. Oh yes, that's right, they do. Professionals state that they're sometimes constrained with the classifications. I've, I've talked with individuals who, um, who have been categorized in a DSM-5 classification um, and, and, and felt that it, it put them in a box that they didn't feel comfortable with. We're gonna talk a little bit about comorbidity. Um, this is when someone might have a, a, a combination of illnesses. Um, and so they feel that um, they can't really fall into one area. And last but not least, when we're looking at it completely from a diagnostic, from diagnostic perspective, and we're just looking at it from that point of view, that's completely the medical model, which is diagnose, do a diagnosis and treat instead of looking at the issues on a public health model um, about all the different things that could lead to um, mental disorders or exasperate them. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in this um lecture today. So one big thing before I talked about was comorbidity. Comorbidity is the idea that two illnesses are happening or more than one illness is happening at the same time. And so one very common one is um, substance abuse and mental disorders. Um, mental disorders uh, and substance abuse like for example, depression um, co could present alongside with, let's say, alcoholism. And, and you could say, was the person um, depressed when they became an alcoholic? Or did the alcoholic uh, alcohol, which is a central nervous system depressant, exasperate depression? Um, one of the other things that, can, that presents together is anxiety and depression. In fact, untreated, uh, we'll see that a lifetime pre prevalence of people with anxiety disorders is 24%. That's nearly 25%. So one out of every f um, four people could have experienced an anxiety disorder in their lifetime. So, um, and then of that, panic attacks are a part of that. And then what happens is that if you research this, untreated anxiety disorders can lead to major depression. In fact, they overlap. And one of the big things that healthcare providers need to do is they need to screen these because treatment for anxiety disorder is different than a mental health major depressive disorder. Um, so again, it's, very, it's one of those things where a trained professional needs to look at these and, and dive down. So for example, someone with limited mental health background, let's say, uh, a physician's assistant, a nurse practitioner who doesn't have a, a deep, or a doctor, general practitioner, who doesn't have an extensive background um, in mental health uh, or mental uh, in treatment of mental illness, um, might treat with psychoactive drugs and not know about the intricacies of these disorders. So what I'm trying to say is that um, this is where psychiatrists um, come in. Psychiatrists are trained medical professionals 
with a focus in and knowledge of psychoactive drugs. So good health professionals know to refer out when it comes to mental health and with mental illnesses specifically. Mental illnesses. So again, the DMS-5 is a, a book. It's a great book. It's in the library. You can pull it up on the website. It's fun to look at. I've just read it for fun, to tell you the truth. And, um, and it's got all these different categories of different um, disorders. And these are classifications. So in your learning module, I put down the screening assessment from the Mental Health America, which there are these little, and it's hyperlinked, into your learning module where you could click in depression test and there's a screening tool, an anxiety test screening tool. And you can see all the different types of screening tools there. And it's really quite a, informative. What it does is it starts to reduce something later that I'm gonna talk about. It's called mental health stigma, where people feel that they can't access services because they're afraid of the stigma or they don't even know about these different um, disorders. And here's the caveat, getting treated. Once people get treated, it could be hormonal, it could be chemical, it could be um, post-traumatic stress disorder that hasn't been treated. And someone's life could dramatically improve. So one of the things I'm gonna stress in this, um, in this uh, presentation, this lecture is that really Referring people to services could change someone's life. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So really, the prevalence of mental disorders in college students and non-college students, they, they differ. And so when you look at mental, um, mental disorders, please look at populations. Um, you know, men compared to women, um, teenagers compared to late adults, it changes based on our time of life, our period of life, what we're going through. And so if you're focusing in on your final project in this area, you need to be very specific about what group you're focusing in on and what disorder. Because alcohol use is different than other types of drug use. And they get treated differently too and they get diagnosed, uh, diagnostic tools that are different, and they get prevention tools that are different. So don't do one size fits all when it comes to mental disorders. So sources of mental health disorders. Some of the things that when we look at mental health disorders, we look at genetics. It could be intrauterine infections. These are infections that happened within inside the uterus during fetal development, low birth weight, preterm birth, Biological agents such as secondhand smoke, head injury, brain trauma, okay? Um, diseases like syphilis, um, the third phase of syphilis starts to lead to uh, mental, health disor uh, mental health disorders, cancer, stroke, um, people who are going through chemotherapy treat treatments. Um, it can really uh, chemically unbalance people and create mental disorders and stress. Stress can definitely impact. And so these are some of the things we're gonna talk about. Um, in your book, there's something called the general uh, adaption uh, syndrome. And this is the idea that when you're, um, when you are going through a stress state that you have a stress response of alarm resistance. And then after that, it goes, you go through your response to um, a threat, you hit normal level of resistance, and then you go back. And this, this really talks about the flight or, uh, flight or fight reaction that your body constantly is going through. And, and if it's one of those things that's constantly gone over and over again, it leads to something called uh, chronic stress that can lead to toxic stress. And so one of the things that I, uh, we talk about and that's in chapter 11 is um, war, um, being in war, that constant trigger, um, going through a traumatic event. Um, and these are pictures from Katrina. Um, so you, you see that this could really cause 
um, something called um, chronic stress because it's just constantly firing and firing and firing. And so someone could be start to experience trauma. So one of the big things that, that your book highlights on and that I want to make sure that I highlight on is that lifelong mental health disorders often have their onset in adolescence. So um, trauma moments in childhood can lead to averse trauma later on in life. And, and they actually have a famous report called the ACE report that really starts to do a correlation between trauma experienced in childhood and long-term effects with physical diseases um, later on in life. And so in your module, I have something called toxic stress. And there's a short video that I would like you to watch. It's like two minutes long that shows you what the, it does to your brain when you experience to toxic stress over and over again, what it does to a child's brain. And it's about two minutes long. So take a look at that. So one of the things that I'd like you to look at is that in your book, um, and there is a scenario. Um, I'd love for you to read it. It's on page 288. Um, and it really talks about mental health stigma. And it's the idea that um, Maria um, experiences stigma. And um, if you look at this, there's something that's called mental health stigma where um, people either discriminate um, with mental health, um, accessing mental health services, or um, are afraid to go get mental health services because of um, this mental health stigma. And um, one of the things I really like are these websites called like eachmindmatters.org um, or Suicide is Preventable. One of the things that they we can do to start addressing mental health stigma is raising awareness on what mental disorders are, that they can be treated, that there are services for them, and uh, giving people language to, to express these things. Also, I'm going to talk about something called mental health first aid, um, where we start to really increase knowledge on how to help when somebody with um, or if we're experiencing a mental disorder. In other words, there are things that we can and cannot, uh, that we can do to make things more accessible for people. So one of the things that I um, really liked was called Cognito, and this is where you have simulations that help people deal with real life conversations around mental health. Um, and and one of these things is that it actually would do put you into these different real um, virtual simulations like a game where you would be doing hypothetical conversations with somebody. And what I took it as a professor um, perspective, um, and um, I took it as a perspective, uh, uh, really help is um, really having tools that increase um, awareness on how to have conversations around um, mental disorders when people need to access mental health services. Uh, and one thing that I uh, had the, uh, that I really enjoyed was something called Cognito. And it gave you real life uh, simulations like real life, right? And one of the things I found was is that often we feel like we need to jump in and actually counsel people um, or, you know, this is what you should do or give advice. What one big thing that they really talk about is how to have conversations that refer people to services and not step in and start becoming a counselor. And that, like, for example, with suicide, if someone says they would, they're thinking about suicide, it's not to start talking to them about reasons for living or anything like this, but simply ask a couple of questions and then make referrals. Um, are you going to kill yourself? The answer is yes. Do you have plans? And really having conversations that actually have referrals. And so one of the things that I want to point out is that there's something called Project Aware. And this is like an eight hour training and they actually have these in Oregon that train um, instructors, um, faculty, teachers, um, police officers, uh, on how to do mental health 
first aid interventions and how to do referrals. Now, here's the big thing. Um, I was a grant writer uh, and uh, we actually wrote for the first wave of these. And the reason why we wrote for these is that we found our police officers um, often, and you'll see, um, that police officers often respond to um, mental health crisis situations. And we found that our police officers were getting into some violent um, interactions or over responding inappropriately um, to some situations because they just didn't have the tools. So we wrote for Project AWARE and we started bringing in this training. So definitely check this out. This is a systemic thing to take a look at. The other thing too is something called trauma-informed care. And this is where health professionals get trained on how to do trauma-informed care. And this means not revisiting trauma, but how to do this in an appropriate way. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out is that um, we can see that homicide, suicide, these are, this is a problem. So if you're working on um, a final project and you're like, I don't understand what she means by finding a problem. Well, this is a problem. This is where you could start. You could start by saying, look at suicide firearms and 15 to 24 year olds or 10 to 14 year olds. This is a showing that, that we have a mental health crisis. Do you get what I'm saying? Or if I'm covering addiction and alcohol poisoning and um, overuse of benzoids, I might want to use this as my problem. Look at all our intent, unintentional poisoning. This is where you start off with a problem and you start saying, wow, what's going on here? So this is some data here to show you um, that we have an issue. One of the big things I want you to be aware of is that we've had a cycle of mental health, a systemic um, gains and setbacks and moving forward in the United States. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to look at page 295. This is where I'd like you to find basically a mental health care before World War II and then the role of hospitals and then something called deinstitutionalization. And so um, I'm not going to roll dice here, but your assignment will be to answer these questions. And some of these I'm definitely going to hit on in the next few slides. Um, so you will see these again in your assignment. This is called moral treatment. And what this is something that Philippe Penel of France developed and was a more humane way of not doing treatment that was inhumane. So this is a picture of um, treatment um, that was often inhumane and unsuccessful. So one of the big things is that um, Philippe Fenel of France starts saying, we need to do um, treatments that are not um, immoral. Um, another key person um, was Dorothy Dix. She has helped establish the first mental health hospitals um, in the States. Prior to this, before um, um, Dorothy and before... Um, Philip Fennell, um, people would be um, in the 19th centuries in poor houses and alms houses that were just worsened and were, it, you know, really made it um, uh, worse as, in many ways. In fact, Thomas Bond opened up the first hospital. So realize that um, in the 18th and 19th century, it was inhumane and unsuccessful. And people like Philip Fennell, came in and developed a more humane approach. Dorothy Dix started to advocate for more mental hospitals in many states. So we went from this movement where we've had little to nothing in 18th and 19th century, and then we had, big, uh, we had people move away to, to more humane treatment, and then we had advocacy with Dorothea Dix. And this is all covered in your book on page 295. And so we established a lot of state mental, health, uh, mental hospitals. Um, and this was the public response. And then, then we had this big movement, um, you know, where we started saying, um, 
uh, different treatments that were done in these hospitals. And so this is an example of an electroconvulsive therapy shock treatment in 1942. This is on page 296. And yes, electroconvulsive therapy is still used today, but um, it was seen as very inhumane and, um, in the hospitals. And um, today it's definitely used um, with sedation and it treats severe depression. But it was one of those common treatments. And maybe you, if you've ever seen one flew over the uh, cuckoo's nest, um, you'll see that this was portrayed very negatively. Um, and there was this kind of this outcry to close down these hospitals to start moving away from this treatment. Um, and I w before I move on to the next slide, you'll see that on page 296, they talk about lobotomies, um, which severs the nerves of the brain. Um, and uh, they started doing these, what they called ice pick lobotomies um, from 1939 to 1967. And then later on, the, the research found that oftentimes one third became worse off. So these treatments in these hospitals kind of had these negative connotations. So they started closing down these hospitals. See right here, big drop and these hospitals started closing down. And what that's called is deinstitutionalization. Um, and this was one of the big things they started doing. And, and it wasn't only just because of the bad reputation of the hospitals had, but was the idea that maybe they're, they're, we could do a more community-based approach and also the cost of the hospitals. But this had an impact on our society. Because what happened to all the people that were in these hospitals, where did they go? And so they went out to these community support programs. This is pretty abysmal looking picture, I have to say, um, that, you know, kind of decentralized it um, and hopefully had a little bit more of a appealing community support group than this dreary picture here. But honestly, um, one of the big things is like with the community mental health, it just did get pushed off to the side. And so what we'll find is that there was an impact with all of this. So before I move off of this section, I want to go back to this. Where did people with mental health illnesses go in the early 19th century? If you look in your book on page 295, you'll find the answer. It was um, alms and poor houses. Who was Thomas Bond? I mentioned him very briefly. He was the first to open the Pennsylvania Hospital. You could read about Philip Pinnell in France and what he did for moral treatment. And then Dorothy Dick's advocacy movement. Uh, the electroconvulsive therapy is covered and lobotomy. And then the changes that happened in 1950. One thing I did not cover here is what is a chemical straitjacket. And this is basically has a lot to do with um, the use of drugs like Valium to sedate. Um, and so this is covered also in your book about how sedation is used. And then there are four reasons for deinstitutionalization. It had something to do with Medicare, Medicaid, budgets, idealism, legal considerations, and the develop and marketing of antipsychotic drugs. Antipsychotic drugs like um, um, Prozac, okay, or, um, or some other drugs that are, are, are antidepressants. That was a big one. And then a little bit about, um, actually, uh, you could read about that on page 298 about the chemical straitjacket and the deinstitutionalization de de is on page 297. And then the community support group is um, on page 298. So take a look at those. So moving forward. So we had deinstitutionalization, but then where did, where did people go? So one of the things briefly covered in your book is that a significant portion of people um, were pushed out into the street. And what we found is that mental health and homelessness are very much correlated together. In fact, in a 1980 study, um, we found that one third of the homeless population was schizophrenic. 
again, 1990s, 10 to 20 times more likely to be in the general population were to be homeless. And then 2016, um, we still see this. And then 2010, uh, 2010 in, in Pennsylvania, homeless population, severe, seriously ill. So what we found was that the homeless population um, really have untreated mental health illnesses. So if you're covering this as your final project, this is data for you to really kind of explore this issue more. There's different types of homelessness too, like rural homelessness. It's not always urban, right? And this is, this is a screenshot of the homeless encampments that are scattered in rural deserts. And, and this is rural homelessness, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen this before. And this is another way of um, that homelessness could be out there and be quietly happening and people needing access to services. The other place where we had a big push is into federal prisons. And we'll see that we have a big percentage of inmates having mental, ser mental illnesses serious enough to require regular treatment. By comparison, more than 30% of those incarcerated in California state, state prisons receive care for a serious mental disorder. And in New York, 21%. And in Texas, 20%. And so what we see is that um, we see policy changes around mental illnesses and in inmates. And so this is something to also, this is definitely a public health issue to explore. And then last, police calls and mental health. One of the big things is that we'll find that 10% of police calls nationwide involve individuals with mental illnesses. And police officers write one third of mental health referrals. Police officers write one third of mental health referrals. And so one of the things I'd like to, I'm gonna put this in your uh, module, is an alternative to police. Instead of police officers responding to a mental health crisis, have a mental health team respond to a mental health crisis. So again, look at the problem. I showed data that we have a problem with homeless, and, um, and police officers responding and to, to these calls and at a real high prevalence rate of mental health illnesses in two populations, and then not having a system in place to respond to it. And so if you're interested, you could look into crisis intervention teams. This is an evidence-based strategy. Or Project AWARE, which is an evidence-based strategy. So these are strategies to address an issue. Last but not least, I want you to be aware of the treatments. Um, and so there are different types of treatments um, that are out there. And one big thing is that when you're not going to be diving into the treatments, but one, because this is a public health class, not a treatment class, but being aware of the different types of treatments is really important so that you could build it into the systems whether developing a technology to improve access to mental health services, um, embedding self-help groups into um, church groups, into school systems, and, and knowing that you can embed some of these treatments into different systems and services out there. Like for example, I mentioned the mental health apps, really developing these apps and using them and increasing access. The last thing I want to hit on is that we have a lack of providers. So it's great that we need we have a need, but maybe we need to increase access. And maybe one of the things that we might need to think about is using telehealth or some other ways to really increase access, maybe using these apps with telehealth. And so with these lack of providers, we need to understand that our system doesn't have many mental health providers and maybe there's a problem accessing these services. One thing that really has expanded this is the Affordable Care Act and mental health increase the coverage significantly. And then if someone doesn't have these services, sometimes it's not even covered under their private insurance. So knowing where you can get access to services that are free for mental health 
So here, um, COCC has free mental health services up to a certain number for COCC students. You can call CAP services for those. Sageview has services. Cascade Peer Mentoring has services. And then um, these are some different services to look into. Um, last but not least, knowing that drugs also are a big part of mental health um, illnesses, mental illness, mental disorders, such as addiction. They change the chemical chemistry of the brain. And they interfere with either the uptake of a neurotransmitter or the um, mimic. So for example, stimulants uh, actually block and increase stimulants in the body. Depressants slow down the central nervous system and inhibit a GABA uptake. Inhalants um, have no medical purpose uh, with glue and paint, um, but um, they can actually stop respiratory breathing. Cannabis can be a depressant, stimulant, and hallucinogenic, and it has it, the addictive property is THC. It can actually, there's a definitely a disorder um, for cannabis. Hallucinogens and opiates. Um, these are all different types of drugs. They're each different with different populations impacted. So, for example, inhalants are more impacted um, by, um, we'll find that 7th and 8th graders are more at risk for glue and paint. And then um, you'll see opiate use higher in some groups than other groups. So one of the big things I'm going to ask you to do is that I'm going to come back over here and uh, get this uh, down and bring this back up and get to our learning module. And if you go into our learning module for this week, which I'm gonna be um, right here, you'll see that I have two different modules. This, this video is gonna be um, living right here in, in this model, in this mental health learning module. But I wanna point out that there's a drug addiction learning module. And I want you to make sure that you watch the short overview on drug abuse and the different classification of drug types. And also how to look up drug abuse information and drug use information and where people are dying of it more. And know that there's tons of resources to track by different types of drugs. So don't lump all drugs in together they are different, okay? So um, that is pretty much it. I'm gonna go back to my, uh, my last item here and make sure that you've got this. So by the end of this right here, I wanted to make sure that you understood the differences between these different phrases. Mental health, I meant words, mental health, mental illnesses, mental disorders, that you understand what a DSM-5 is, that you know some of the causes of mental disorders. I want you to make sure that you watch that toxic stress video. Um, I have an assignment for you to, to look up the history of mental health. I want you to make sure that there's definitely some issues with our homeless population and also prison population being overrepresented and burdened with um, mental illnesses. They have a high prevalence rate. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about treatments and then um, than some different challenges that are out there. I did also mention two evidence-based strategies, and I'll make sure to highlight those in the module too. All right, that's it. Have a great day.